coming across with with um, elected officials. So, you know, remember, we've been focusing on pluralism and elitism in this class. So if we look at interest groups from a pluralist point of view, they're going to consider interest groups good because they directly link the individual with the government. Uh, they also try to handle the individual and the group's uh, well-being. They help reduce politically divisive context, uh, conflicts and they provide stability. Um, when we take another assumption of this pluralist theory, remember pluralist theory is the idea that, you know, you have different groups involved to advocate for their own interest. Um, you know, sometimes these groups do have an elite bias to it, and a lot of them are class-based. So, you know, most of these organizations will have a strong middle and upper class bias. Um, usually these are people, you know, who have money and have the time to dedicate to these type of interests. And when we look at this upper class blacks as well as, um, you know, middle class, upper middle class blacks as well as upper middle class whites from the North help le lead the civil rights organizations. Um, liberal causes derive draw from you know the university educated and academically connected and even though a lot of us are members of organizations whether it be the nra or PETA or mad um only a minority are active so again you could see that evolution of elitism coming into interest group membership as well um the dominate dominance of business and union resort uh, union organizations have been prevalent here in the united states you know in the in in matters of interest group monies coming toward them you know we have the u.s chamber of commerce the national Affan association of manufacturers who help you know push interest on the congress with regards to maybe real estate or or maybe lending laws and all of these things that maybe businesses will, will be interested in. And specific business interests are also represented by trade associations like the American Banker Association or the American Iron Steel Institute. Organized labor is also a big part. Um, usually organized labor will, will contribute money to Democratic candidates. Uh, Democrats are a little bit more uh, kind of in, in, in step, in lockstep with unions. But a lot of unions remain a powerful political influence in Congress, whether it's the AFL-CIO, uh, SEIU, which is probably one of the bigger ones, um, you know, some some uh, manufacturing unions. But one thing that we kind of learned about in unions is most of them are going to be in the government sector. So government employees have become uh, become really powerful. But we've also seen. Uh, membership dwindle a bit and that's due to things like outsourcing and you know a lot of laws being put into place that now that protect the worker as opposed to the union having to protect the worker uh, but with that being said you know organized labor is still a very influential uh thought or an into influential influ influential uh kind of practices on on members of congress by you know using money and stuff like that so like i said we have seiu which is the service employee international union in our american federation of labor and the farm workers union so if we kind of go and talk about some of the elite bias of interest groups we'll also talk about single issue interest groups and these people are really going to be committed to their cause and these people are going to have a strong commitment to that cause um, you know, they advocate for some type of single or ideological cause, whether it's abortion, gun rights, um, maybe same-sex rights. Um, and we have a list of them here, like the NRA. Emily's List, which is an interest group that looks for pro-choice women to run for Congress and helps fund their election. We have MAD, which is Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which advocates for stronger drunk driving laws. Um, the National... Abortion and Reproductive Rights Action League and the National Right to Life Count, uh, Committee, uh, both, you know, kind of in tune to the abortion arguments and trying to advocate each of their positions with regards to reproductive rights. We also have civil rights organizations, and one of the oldest civil rights organizations is the NAACP, or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which was founded in 1909. Uh, kind of also continuing the theme of civil rights organizations, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was organized around, you know, kind of those nonviolent Gandhi type efforts that Martin Luther King Jr. used. 
the National Council of La Raza, who advocates for Latino rights and gets out kind of voter outreach for Latino groups, and the Anti-Defamation League, which kind of fights bigotry and promotes religious freedom, separation of church and state. Let's have women's groups, and a lot of these date back all the way to, to kind of, you know, partly of the anti-slavery society and pre Civil War. Uh, the League of Women Voters, which is a pretty profound group that still exists today, provides information to voters, backs registration, and get out to vote efforts. Uh, most of these um, individuals, uh, uh, rights organizations, um, are still active, and probably the more known one is the National Organization of Women, or now, they're probably the most active uh, women's rights groups out there. We also have LGBTQ groups, and a lot of these might, you know, be like the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, uh, Human Rights Campaign, and and, um, and uh, Equality California. Now, you know, as part of kind of labor movements that we saw, we did have, you know, a very significant farm workers movement here in California in the 60s into the 70s. Uh, the AWC, which uh, was the Agro -work Workers Organizing Committee, is led by Larry Itzalong, who was a Filipino American, and the NFWA, which is the National Farm Workers Association, which who was led by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, they kind of merged and formed. Uh, the United Farm Workers Movement. One of the, some of the issues were at, at, ha at hand were, you know, obviously pay and working conditions. Uh, when we talk about one way to get a business's attention is to hurt their bottom line. So we saw the Delano Grape Strike that was a collaboration between Filipino and Mexican Americans um, workers who had traditionally been recruited to work. Uh, during the other groups' protest actions, so trying to, in a sense, uh, kind of create that uh, f kind of idea of solidarity between uh, the groups. Uh, the groups got together and sought a raise of 25 cents an hour, and you know that doesn't sound much to to us, but remember this is in 19 uh, the 1960s, so that you know might be a pretty significant increase for back then, and we saw the two two groups merge together and form the United Farm Workers Union. Again, you know, committed to a nonviolent protest and they, you know, wanting to organize migrant farm workers and improve, you know, living conditions, wages, maybe some benefits. Um, and, you know, they had a profound impact on, on labor here in California. The great grape strike started in 1965 and lasted all the way to 1970. Um, you know, the, the, the pickers refrained from, you know, picking grapes at some of the wineries and some of the fruit picking places that were out there. Uh, some of the growers brought in what's called scab labor, meaning people who aren't unionized and coming, who come in to take union uh, jobs. Um, some of these workers actually earned less than federal minimum wage because they might have been, you know, paid under the table. And, you know, we lost grapes. They were spoiled and rotten. It turned out to be a success. Uh, gr grape growers signed their first union contract granting workers benefits, uh, workers better pay, benefits, and protection. And as we kind of look through history and look at some of the, the things that were happening, farm workers were often not paid and were not denied rights to, to unionize. Um, they worked in humane, inhumane conditions, you know, hot weather without bathroom breaks, without water breaks, uh, no toilets in the fields. Um, you know, we're forced to live on as little as $2 a day, um, are forced to pay as little, as much as $2 a day to live in metal shacks that didn't have any plumbing or electricity. And on top of that, grape pickers were paid an average of 90 cents per hour plus 10 cent per basket picked. And that put them below, below what the federal poverty line was at the time. Um, if we look at uh, who can make a difference with an interest groups, um, you know, usually large interest groups have a better chance to access a group's, uh, you know, uh, groups kind of talk with uh, legislatures. Uh, usually legislatures will meet with large groups just to the fact, due to the fact that they have, at times, many of them have deep pockets. As opposed to smaller groups, you know, smaller groups can make some noise as well, but I think larger groups have a tendency to have more access to legislatures. 
Um, smaller groups, if you have a right situation and a right issue of time, they can make a very real argument and a very real impact on, on, on Congress. If we look at some of the groups, we have trade association groups like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers. We also have labor on the side, which is the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organization, which is the AFL-CIO, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. And these are you know, just a handful of examples of these trade association groups. When we look at single issue groups versus traditional interest groups, single interest groups will focus on one narrow concern, whether it's reproductive rights, animal rights, uh, environmental rights. This has actually enhanced members' access to legislatures as, you know, as we've seen the decline of political parties, candidates have turned to single issue interest groups whose electoral influence has grown, maybe with their members or with their constituents or whatever. Um, and, you know, these are more representative of the views of the members because they can't be changed or they can't be compromised. Um, most More responsive to issues and parties and traditional interest groups. So, you know, like we said, the N N NRA is a very, you know, strong interest group. And if you go on to this open secret website that I'm going to give you, you're going to see that they give a lot of money to maybe the Republican Party who tend to advocate a little bit more for uh, you know, less gun right, I mean, less gun restrictions as opposed to anti gun groups. We also have a thing called lobbying, and lobbying is, in a sense, a form of legal bribery. So, in lobby, what will happen is an interest group will have hand, will hire a lobby group, and the lobby group kind of acts as, as a conduit between the interest group and the political part and the political candidate. So, for instance, uh, the NRA is funded by membership dues and contributions. They hire lobbyists who advocate for the NRA's interests with members of Congress. They give payments or they give donations. And as long as it's reported and as long as it is totally disclosed and within the limits, it's legal. I have the limits posted in this module. I also have a video called The Lobbyist Playbook that I want you to watch. It talks about a guy named Jack Abramoff, who was a Washington lobbyist, and and take a look at how much money he was making and some of the problems he may have gotten into when he was a lobbyist. Obviously, lobbying, you need access. You need to have uh, access to individual decision makers that you may have a personal contact with. You may have their cell phone number. You may have their email address. You may know their staff. So... That's probably the most valuable resource to have. And many professional lobbyists are former members of Congress, and they have an advantage because they already have the phone number. They already have the email address. They already have uh, maybe a, a personal relationship with the decision maker. And the greatest gift you can give to a candidate is to uh, mobilize voters or get voters to vote for an individual. That is the greatest gift a lobbyist can offer. Lobbyists can also provide information. Once access is gained, information is most is a most valuable resource, right? Uh, you know, lobbyists can track bills affecting their interests. They can provide research. They can provide debate material. They could uh, provide information to the news media. They can provide a lot of valuable resources that candidates can use. Skip that. You also have grassroots mobilization. Uh, these mobilize constituents to apply pressure uh, to decision makers by emails and calls or by visits to offices. And you know a lot of it is mobilization of the press and elites in the Congress, uh, the Congress member's home district. Like we said, you also have direct contacts and influential lobbyists in a sense, at times will make more money than Congress, congressional members, they lobby. And like we said, there's kind of a revolving door or a, a, a situation where people will get into Congress and they'll do their time and then they'll leave and then they'll become lobbyists and in a sense, they'll be making more money. Um, you know, if we talk about the sectors, whether it's health, uh, you know, real estate, insurance, 
the economic sector, banking, finance, insurance, and real estate all spend the most money for lobbying because in a sense, when you think about it, that's where a lot of the money is here in our economy. Um, when we talk about campaign supports, you have, you know, as the cost of campaigning has gone up astronomically, uh, legislatures must depend more heavily on contributions from lobbyists and interest groups. So what will happen is interest groups and lobbyists will make donations to these candidates and these candidates can use that money in order to fund their re-election campaign or any type of campaign, whether it's commercials, print ads, TV ads, radio ads, mailers. They could all be used with fundraising money. And if we look at the different industries and who they who they tend to to help, you know, we look at the Democrats. They usually rely on lawyers, lobbyists, law firms, Hollywood, and labor unions. If we look at the Republicans, they'll rely on business, real estate, um, oil and gas, health and pharmaceuticals, and manufacturing. Now, there's some questions on how we should regulate the lobbies. Here in our module, I have the contribution limits that you could possibly give to an individual uh, through a campaign. Uh, the most we can give to an individual person that is running for a campaign is $2,900 an election cycle. So if you uh, want to support you know, we'll say that Biden is not going to run for re-election and Harris is going to run for president in 2024. If you want to donate to Harris's primary campaign, you can give her $2,900 during the primary. And then you can give an additional $2,900 during the general election, which is the big one. So, uh, you know, Biden... Back in 2020, won the Democratic primary. Before that election was over, you could have given him $2,900 to to uh, use for that elect for that campaign. And then when he moved on to the general election in November, you could have given him another $2,900. Uh, but you know, the, the the these laws are put into place to kind of prevent people from you know individuals from buying. Uh, elections and we're gonna look at some different ways that people kind of get a, around with that but laws require reports only on money spent on direct lobbying before Congress and these laws only apply to lobbying Congress not administrative agencies or the executive branch so we have also something called political action committees and these are non-party organizations that solicit voluntary camp, uh, contributions to disperse the uh, political candidates so a large number of these are going to be in the corporate sector so you know they kind of act as a bit of a bank to these interest groups and to these candidates so an interest group or candidate can help set up a political action committee and solicit uh, donations for that political action committee a lot of these times these PACs are going to prefer incum incumbents incumbents are people that are already in office so somebody that is currently holding a seat in Congress or in the presidency is considered to be the incumbent. And generally, you know, in re-election campaigns, uh, incumbents will win about 90% of the time. So obviously, PACs and interest groups are going to prefer incumbents because they have a better chance of winning. And PACs will spend money on indirect expenditures, including ads or endorsements that are paid for directly by the candidates' campaigns. And we'll talk about the concept of super PACs in a little bit. So here's a little bit more about political action committees and how much you can contribute to them. 527s. And we also have super PACs. Super PACs have kind of been an invoked thing since uh, mid-2016. Uh, what super PACs are, are super PACs are um, a group of individuals or corporations or whatever that can spend an unlimited amount of money on political campaigns as long as they're not affiliated with the campaign. So if I form a super PAC, 
um, and I'm within the laws of a super PAC as long as I don't get directed by the candidate on what to do, I could spend as much money as I want on these campaigns. There's no restrictions. And this comes out of a case called Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission. So this was a landmark Supreme Court case that, uh, you know, prohibited government from restricting independent political expenditures by nonprofits, for profits, labor unions, and other associations. Um, Citizens United was a conservative, uh, kind of charitable organization in the United States, founded in 1988. Uh, what they wanted to do was uh, film a, a, a movie that was, or a documentary that was critical to Hillary Clinton. Um, we had something in, in 2002 called the Bipartisan Com Campaign Reform Act, commonly known as McCain-Feingold. And they prevented these types of, of um, kind of these types of television broadcast for a certain period before the election. Section 203 of the McCain-Feingold Act defined electioneering com communication as a broadcast cable satellite communication that mentioned a candidate with 60 days of the general election. Remember, that's going to be 60 days of the election in November or 30 days in the advance of a primary or the, the elections that happen in March to choose candidates to to run for uh, to run who to to who's going who's going to represent the the party in elections so 60 days before the general 30 days before the primary um the, it was decided that corporations and labor unions using money was a form of free speech and that if you limited the amount of money that a corporation or a labor union could give uh that was limiting their free speech, which kind of is a little bit weird when we take a look at it. Remember earlier I just said that we as individuals are limited to giving $2,900 to a candidate. Um, corporations and labor unions are not under that limitation as long as they're not in coordination with the candidate or not being directed by the candidate. Um, 